Hey everybody, thank you for joining this uh, World of Work Week live panel discussion with the Aldridge Foundation. Um, my name is Patrick Scally uh, and I'm from the Trampery. Uh, we kind of put this panel together with the Aldridge Foundation to talk a little bit about uh, what it is we do um, as a co-working space business support provider, uh, social enterprise. And, and the kind of theme of this is working for you in 2020. So we're going to talk a little bit about how you can work sustainably as well as giving advice on the panelists will give advice on their career journeys, skills of the future that they think will be really kind of pertinent roles of the future, but kind of trying to always underpin it with a, a level of personal sustainability and wellness, which is a big kind of focus of the Trampery's mission and hopefully it'll be a part of, kind of your lives going forward. So I'll give a little introduction on the Trampery before I'll uh, introduce the panelists and then um, and then we'll, get, we'll kick on with the dialogue. Uh, but just in case you didn't know, so the Trampery is um, a London-based social enterprise and we specialise in shared work space and support for entrepreneurs uh, and creative businesses, as I've said. Um, and since we founded our Tech City's first startup workspace, the Trampery has cultivated an ecosystem of acclaimed shared workspaces and sector-focused facilities, specifically uh, in London. Um, and we've had more than 500 businesses called the Trampery Home since our inception. And since 2015, we've been really focusing with the Greater London Authority, uh, the London Legacy Development Corporation and uh, Bob Harker to kind of underpin a new cluster uh, of spaces and community running down the, the Lee Valley. Uh, so that's all the way from kind of Tottenham down to Hackney Wick, which um, we'll kind of cover a little bit as we go. And uh, obviously our team in here are from Trampery Fishana Village, as well as Trampery McGantry. And uh, JC, who's in the call, one of our members is... Uh, one of our members from the Trampery Republic, which is in East India Dock. Um, so yeah, before I kind of introduce the panel and they give a little bit of a, a preamble on themselves, please do add questions in as we go. Don't necessarily wait till the end to uh, have the Q&A section. If any of our panelists mention anything of interest to you, or you've got questions or things aren't clear, um, please just put them in the chat box. I'll have an eye on that as we go. And then we can um, yeah, have it be like a pretty open dialogue between all of us. Um, so yeah, I guess to the panelists, like, uh, it'd be great if you could just give a little uh, introduction on yourself, your kind of background, um, your kind of academic experience, um, and then a little bit about the kind of industry that you work in now. So I guess uh, go. I was going to say ladies first, but there's two ladies in the call. Um, but I'll go to, to Zara first, if that's okay. So Zara Sahir Ashraf, who's um, fashion program manager for the Trampery. So uh, Zara, if you could just give us a little introduction on yourself, that'd be amazing. Yeah, thank you. Um, thanks so much for kicking us off, Patrick. Um, and as so kindly introduced, um, I'm Zara um, and I work for the Trampery as the Fashion Programme Manager. And what that means is um, no two days are really the same um, with what we do at the Trampery. Um, but in the world of fashion, um, that is ever more true. Um, and a lot of the work that we do is centered around the notion of sustainability. So not just from an environmental aspect, um, but um, I think a topic that we'll probably touch on um, quite a lot um, over the duration of today is the concept of social sustainability as well. Um, and a lot of the work that um, myself um, and the team do is rooted in um, really helping um, emerging uh, businesses and brands um, around um, London, but most, more primarily the East London area, um, to help integrate um, what sustainability means um, to them. Um, and I feel as though it's a bit of an ubiquitous term. Um, it's definitely um, within the zeitgeist at the moment. Um, so hopefully um, I can give you a bit of insight in terms of um, what that means to us, but also um, from a social aspect as well. Um, I've worked in the fashion industry um, for over 10 years now, um, coming from um, a buying background. Um, I used to work for um, quite a well-known uh, fast fashion retailer um, for eight years. Um, so it's been quite a change in terms of um, moving over to the other side and um, what I found um, now more than ever um, it's really important to make sure uh, that you feel passionate um, and deeply instilled in the work that you do um, so um, that's brought me over to the trampery in terms of um, really helping businesses be more sustainable um, which is only going to come more and more important um, as we move through, uh, through the century. Amazing. Thank you, Zara. And yeah, we'll speak a little bit about fashion with your work as we kind of go on. And uh, moving on to you, Kate, uh, Kate Allen, who's house manager at the place I am right now, which is the Trampery on the Gantry in uh, Hackney Wick. Uh, yeah, same question to you, a little bit about, about your background and kind of what got you here and, and anything else you'd like to raise, I guess. Sure. Thanks again, Patrick. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm Kate Allen. I have been working in the role as house manager at the Trampery on the Gantry for just coming up to a year now. Um, prior to that, I have a background in sort of project management and account management and actually even worked in the luxury retail space. Um, 
So I've worked across industries like design, corporate well-being um, and community development as well. Um, and those skill sets, I've always kind of used those as the basis for what my, what my role was, but wasn't defined by a particular role. So that's why the, the Trampery role is so unique in that I didn't come out of university. Uh, I did a degree in advertising, by the way, because I didn't really know what I wanted to do. I wanted to do something creative, but I myself didn't have quite the skill set to launch into a particular niche. Um, I have been trying as I go along, but I think my skill set more lies in sort of social uh, community development. So my skill set previously is kind of ideal for the role at the Trumpery because as Zara said, no two days are the same. We work with some really incredible businesses from architects to photographers, to um, sound producers, to photojournalism, you know, all sorts, all along the spectrum. So being that kind of platform to look after those businesses as they grow, see what cool projects they're working on and just be there as a support because when you're your own business, this is what brings people to a co-working space is it can get a little bit lonely and you don't have sometimes a team to bounce ideas off of. So to be part of a community like that and to shape a community around the amazingly creative people that are part of it, I think is such a unique experience and, and the Trampery always wishes to excel in that kind of community building. Um, social impact is another thing that I'm incredibly interested in. I've done a few courses in it and the Trampery being a social enterprise means that the, um, the profit that we generate from um, our studio and desk spaces means that we can invest that back into the community. So we can offer um, free programs, free business support, community events, uh, anything that our, our lovely members such as JC feel like they need to... <laughs> To, uh, to progress on their journey. Uh, so it's a real pleasure to work for such a, a unique and forward-thinking company. Thank you, Kate. And uh, yeah, I guess as Kate mentioned, the, the Trampery is nothing without its members. So we definitely wanted to bring um, someone from our community who works with us and we get to work for, which is uh, uh, what it's all about. And so JC Candonado, um, dear friend uh, of the Trampery Republic, um, it'd be great to hear your background. I think is super interesting how you got to this point now in, in your work in photography. So it'd be great to hear a little bit about yeah, your background, academic experience, um, and we can go from there. So over to you, JC. For sure. Thank you so much, Patrick. Thank you, everyone. Um, my name is JC Candanillo. I'm a photographic artist based here in London. I work in fashion and portraiture, and my work explores human rights, mental health, and national identity. And before becoming a photographer, uh, I used to be a project manager for 20 years, more or less, working in different industries from telecommunications to fashion. And in the last few years of my career uh, there, I worked in a fashion house in Barcelona, which only made it uh, a no-brainer to transition into fashion photography when I set up myself as a photographer later on. Um, I'm a member, like um, Patrick said, um, of the Tramper here, here at Trampery Republic in East London and everything the three of them have said about the supportive environment that you find here at the Trumpery is true. And I'm really, really happy to be a member of the community. Thank you. And I, I guess I'll stick with you now, I've got you and you've said some kind of things. Uh, but yeah, I, I think the, the most uh, vital thing with these conversations and these dialogues is to really start from the beginning. Um, we all have one, I think that's the unifying thing. And uh, as you talked about a little bit about your work, having a social mission and, and that being a real focus of your photography and your practice. And you do talk about uh, your work as a photographer is ultimately to help make this world uh, a better place, which I think is a beautiful sentiment. But did that kind of compassion um, come from your experiences growing up, maybe your family, or was that kind of a sentiment that as you uh, developed in your career, you felt, you know, I need to work for something other than, you know, just a paycheck or just a, a, a brief, so to speak. How did that kind of uh, proposition come to you? That's a very good question because uh, when I was a child, my dad always used to say that I was the paladin of justice, that I had like a superhero complex because I always wanted to solve all the injustices in the world. But then as I grew older, you have other priorities. You have your studies, you have your work, you, you need to pay the bills as soon as you start living on your own. And I sort of like just focus on myself and my career. And it wasn't until I was um, in my 30s that I, had, I was already living here in Europe and I was looking around myself and looking what was going on in the world and the things that I thought were not ethical and the companies that I worked for. And I thought that 
because I had had um, a very sort of like privileged upbringing and I never had any um, issues uh, growing up and I had a very good education and then I, I come to, came to Europe and was noticing all this discrimination and all the things that were going um, on around me and the unethical practices in the companies where I work for that I thought that maybe it was a good time to give back to the community. I, I, I had um, a lot of really good opportunities uh, that helped me get where I am right now. So I thought maybe it was about time to give back and also offer those opportunities um, to, to others. And I think it wasn't until I was in my 40s that I realized that even though I was doing that in my personal life, I was volunteering and trying to help organizations that worked in issues that I believed in. Um, I never thought that I could also apply that to my uh, work life. I thought that that was just my personal life. And when I was in my 40s, I, I thought, wait a minute, my, my personal life and my career life, they all have one thing in common, which is me. So why not join the two things together and then make that influence the way that I run my business? And that's what I've been doing. I think that's really interesting. I think that idea of, you know, you talk about it, it kind of later into your career, that kind of realization of how you can mix those things. I think something that we often don't think about when we're younger is that it is a journey and you're not going to have the answers straight away about who you are and what you're going to do and how that's going to form from your personal life to your work life. So yeah, I guess that take a little bit of that pressure off yourself, I guess, if you're feeling that, especially now, because obviously there's a lot of unique pressures that we all kind of feel. But um, going over to you, Zara, I mean, in terms of your, your kind of family life and um, kind of mentors or friends that you've had, people that have been important to you, what kind of, say, like inspiration or life lessons could have you drawn from, from kind of earlier years um, and earlier experiences that you now kind of continue to reference throughout your, your kind of current practice? Um, I really find um, it was so refreshing to hear um, more about JC's upbringing in terms of um, it's almost that aha moment of like you mentioned where you realise um, that it's a journey and that um, there is actually um, different parts of what you feel passionate about can really come together and not not exist in silo and that's definitely what happened to me so um uh, and i think um it would definitely be a disservice to ignore certain parts of my identity and how that came to um really mold um where i am today so um i come from um quite a traditional pakistani family um i'm the first uh, generation uh, to of my family to be able to attend university um and i think um quite often when you're a child of immigrants if you will um there's a almost a responsibility um uh, on you that's kind of almost unrivaled in terms of um, you're not necessarily afforded the same autonomy perhaps um, of your peers in the way that um, uh, being able to go ahead and go and do what you love or perhaps um, uh, have the freedom to fail in certain things there's there's a responsibility um, to, to succeed and, and perhaps pursue um, career uh, paths that are um, a bit more traditional in terms of uh, kind of uh, banking or finance um, or, uh, or, or the medical industry. So um, I found um, growing up, um, whilst I was very inspired um, from my upbringing, um, uh, working, uh, going into the fashion industry, um, my mother um, was a dressmaker. So I always uh, grew up seeing her uh, measuring things, cutting things, um, uh, wearing her own designs. And that I found that very um, empowering. But on the flip side, um, that's something that is quite traditional in, t in, um, in Asian households, um, uh, almost to the detriment. So as we're seeing now, um, there are workers um, in Leicester, but also on the other side of the world um, that are in, um, in uh, conditions that um, are very unsavory in terms of um, being able to um, make money off of their craft and being marginalized for that. We're seeing that in uh, fast fashion um, factories um, around the world. Um, so going into the fashion industry um, and, it, and into a creative um, career, um, I definitely felt, felt as though um, I couldn't fail or I couldn't uh, couldn't almost shift or it had to be very very rigid I'd made a decision quite early on that this is something that I want, wanted to pursue um, and I had to be good at it um, and um, much like JC a couple of years ago um, I had that realization that actually um, there were those two sides of my identity that could exist um, and that perhaps um, your journey is a bit more fluid and you are able to to change and have that autonomy um, that I think um, not just uh, those of um, perhaps my upbringing but also our generation that perhaps our parents didn't feel as though uh, they had that um, that option to be able to choose and change um, so about uh, four or five years ago I made the decision um, to make a shift um, from fast fashion 
um, from quite a young age, I've always been quite political, um, much like JC. And I think um, what's great about the Trampery is that you are surrounded by those that have uh, share similar social values to you. Um, but I really struggled growing up and working in the fashion industry with finding a way um, for those two parts of my identity to coexist in terms of almost fueling um, mass, uh, uh, mass marketing um, and consumerism, but also being very conscious and wanting to be sustainable. And how do those two parts of my identity exist? And um, that's almost how I uh, found myself at the Trampery um, a couple of years ago. Um, and I'm really trying to um, take what I've learned from my previous experiences and try and change that in uh, today's industry. So very similar to JC in terms of having that realization moment and really making um, your own path um, and uh, trying to make it your own. Amazing. And Kate, you, you talked uh, in your kind of introduction about your academic start in kind of advertising and um, ultimately kind of having, I guess, a kind of non-linear career route. Um, I know that wellness and, and kind of yoga and things like that have been a, a huge part of your life, which I think um, it'd be interesting to hear your thoughts on kind of that passion and profession kind of blend. But I guess in terms of your, your kind of career route, um, what have kind of been the personal principle, principles that have kind of guided your decisions throughout your professional career? And then I guess in terms of, have you had like mentorship or have you, are there great, is there literature that's helped you make these kind of bold career decisions and change paths? How have you managed to navigate the way you have so effectively? To be honest, I think part of my character is, and there are sort of benefits and pitfalls to it, but I, I'm a bit of a chameleon, which means that I find a new idea and I think I want to do that. But unfortunately, it makes it very hard to pin down exactly what it is I want to do. So it's been a very, very fluid journey, um, but not dissimilar to you, Zara. My brother and I were the first in our family to, to go to university. Um, our parents kind of fell into the working world. My mum went to secretarial college and then she kind of maintained that profession throughout her life because she, you know, she was a, a provider of the family. By my age, she was already married with a child on the way. Um, and my brother, who was nine years older, just knew what he wanted to be. When he went to university, he went straight into law and he's been for the, at the same law firm for over 10 years. Uh, and I was a bit of a wild card because, again, I had that personality where there was just so much choice. It was, it was so overwhelming. And because there wasn't something that I just, that just really clicked for me to go down a path, my, my whole my whole life up to now has just been trying out new ideas and seeing where it sits. And Patrick, going back to what you said about well-being, when I was in my first year at university, I went through um, a really difficult time adjusting. I'm from a very small village in Hampshire and I came to university in London and the, I, I think, you know, just the, the shock of suddenly being part of this city, the city that never sleeps. And again, uh, for me, that someone that is so overwhelmed with options coming to London, it was suddenly like, you know, fireworks going off because there was just so much. Um, and it led to, yeah, a little bit of a rocky start. But then I started getting into um, sort of meditation and yoga. And since then, I have really had a, a big focus on what it means to have you know, to, to look after your own well-being and what things you can do to empower yourself um, to, to take care of yourself and to go easy on yourself. I think our generation, it's kind of the age of anxiety. I, I know so many friends that have, um, that have had to go on to medication or seek counselling just because of, of so much stimulation and so many things that they've had to deal with. And I think I kind of made it my mission to get clued up on on literature, on tools, on anything that I can offer to support people in that position without them having to, to go down a route of um, to somewhat some self-destruction and doing things that aren't very helpful to them. Um, so yeah, I kind of developed on that. I did a course in um, mindfulness um, and various other things for sort of mental brain training. Um, and then I worked for a corporate wellbeing company who specialized in creating programs for big companies to look after their employees because suddenly now we are in this shift where employee wellbeing is just is, is kind of the most important thing at the moment. We're, we're really, we've reached a critical point where we have to accept responsibility for that. And we need to invest in employees and make sure that they, they are being looked after and they feel supported in their working environment. 
So I've been so glad to see that happen and that being in the forefront of a lot of companies' minds and employees now have a position to, to say that they should have this. This is just a basic right for people to have. And again, going back to the trampery, this is a, a major pillar that we want, to, um, we want to implement across the sites for our own team and for, for also our members. Um, so again, all these little, these little avenues that I've gone down have somehow led to this role where I can really bring in all of that, um, that kind of experience and knowledge and, and try and make a better impact. Absolutely. And I think that point about taking on doing extra courses while, while working and while studying, I think is really important just to kind of develop a, a more broad approach to how you yeah, approach your work, how your personal life, whatever it might be. And JC, I know that you've been um, a mentor, student careers mentor with Kingston University for the past year or so. And how important do you think it is for, for kind of students to learn additional skills, you know, whether it's online courses or temporary roles or volunteering uh, whilst at school, but then also, you know, as they get into the first steps of their career and beyond. How, how vital do you think that is for people to, to undertake? Well, uh, first of all, uh, about mentorships, I think it is vital to seek out uh, mentors to help you out in your career because mentors are people that are uh, within an industry who are willing to share their knowledge and to, and to uh, help uh, other people be able to work um, in the industry that they are working in. Um, because as mentors, we know how hard it is. We know all the things that we had to do to get to where we are right now. So we're trying, we are willing to offer that sort of help and advice and inspiration to uh, younger people coming into the industry so that they don't have it as hard as we did. Um, also, we know how things work within the industry. So if you're trying to enter uh, any type of industry, we know, um, the path that you, that you need to take, um, who to talk, uh, how to approach um, jobs and, and jobs off, and job offers. So I think that it's, it's crucial to seek out uh, mentors, whatever your, your uh, career path is. In terms of um, uh, education and, uh, and forming yourself, coming from the creative industries and the creative industry side, I think um, it is it's something that you cannot take for granted. It's, it, is, it is mandatory that you need to keep on self-improving yourself. Uh, long gone are the times when you uh, studied something and then you just worked on that forever and never had to, um, to reinforce your knowledge again because things change so fast, technology changes so fast, times change, nothing is what it used to be in early 2020 and we're only six months into the year. So imagine your career for the next 40 or 50 years of your life, it's gonna change so much. So you have to be constantly updating yourself and, and the knowledge that you have, uh, otherwise you stagnate. I think that's a great point. And again, I guess to, to, the, to the panel as well as the audience, please feel free to, to add points and questions as we go to each other, and not like the, the, the ringmaster of this circus, please feel free <laughs> if someone says something interesting, just jump in and cut me off. Um, but I guess so to, to all of you, I guess really, to, speaking about the kind of roles of the future, um, you know, whether it be in fashion or whether it be wellness or photography, what kind of skills and roles do you think, especially coming out of this period now of a little bit of instability, what skills do you think will be pertinent to the, the roles of the future in your respective um, field to anybody? Well, speaking from the creative industries and, and for the fashion industry in particular, what we have seen um, during these past few months is that um, we need digital skills now more than ever. People have gotten used to uh, doing everything online, shopping online, communicating with other people online, connecting with the world online. And um, with the, the crisis that we have seen in the high street over the past few years, and now with all the shops closing in different parts of the country, um, everything is going to be moving towards the online uh, world. So if you are a creative, specifically a photographer, and you're thinking about your career, focus on everything digital, focus on, on learning e-commerce techniques, what images sell, what don't sell, what does it mean to work in a studio environment in a brand that shoots for their e-commerce, Everything that has to be uh, that has to do with online skills are going to be a must from now on. Yeah, and Jack, I think just um, related to that, but just um, also more specifically, um, as we are living in a, a very digital world, and I think 
JC, as you mentioned, it's, it's just going to speed up um, with the acceleration of um, lockdown, of course. And we've all been a lot more switched on. And I think um, it's especially pertinent um, from a young age um, to make sure in a healthy way that um, being mindful of um, whatever it is that your brand is online as well. So I think even if you're not quite sure what avenue it is that you want to go down, um, if it's um, a career in um, a creative um, disciplinary, I think making sure that you are um, being mindful of what you're posting online, making sure that there is some sort of um, image that you're trying to craft, um, being mindful of the work that you're putting up, um, because um, in a digital world, that will be your currency. Um, and I think now more than ever, um, a lot of agencies, a lot of brands are looking um, through different means um, and different channels um, to look for new talent. So, uh, for example, uh, things like in Instagram, um, if you're a visual artist, so like JC, a photographer, um, or even if you work in illustration, um, or just using it as a bit more of a creative outlet um, and, a, and a mood board um, to really help um, articulate your vision. Um, or um, if it's writing that you want to go into, even if you feel as though nobody's going to read it, definitely um, blog, use Twitter, um, have some sort of archive that you can um, over the years hone um, and really mould and shift um, and really point to, um, because that will be useful um, later on down the line. And I think um, uh, something that Kate touched on a, a little bit earlier is um, trying to um, learn as much as possible and understanding that now. Um, we can be multidisciplinary and we can pick up new skills um, all the time and, um, and have those different um, skills that um, you can point to to employees that will make you stand out from the rest. Yeah, absolutely. And I guess in terms of that, for, for all of you guys, the, a question that uh, Kate Tinsley's put in the, the chat box, thank you, Kate, um, about what kind of skills you've needed or, or you or yourself on how to stay kind of motivated um, when working for you, I guess probably be interesting if we could all reflect a little bit on specifically now that we're working from home but also in the office and, uh, and different working environments what what principles what kind of routine structure what things have been really beneficial for you all during your career to, to stay motivated um just jumping back to the the previous question sorry i hope that's okay just as an addition to um to jc and zara's points and and probably relating to kay's question as well um, is never underestimate the importance of soft skills and your your person ability as a person. I am sure I've gone for job interviews and I have not been the most qualified person in the room, but because I I invest a lot in in how I show up as a person and relationship building and whatever industry you go on, particularly if you're going to work for yourself, building those connections is absolutely critical in a time like this when we come out the other side freelancers will be relying on those really good relationships they've had because those are going to be the clients that are going to want to use them in these uncertain times so um so for us for a moment try and put the ego aside and just make human-centered connections um i i really feel that is, is so beneficial to whatever it is you want to go into bring personality and bring your unique self into whatever it is that you do Great points, yeah. Um, so another question kind of coming in, a couple of questions, to, I guess, uh, probably specifically to you, Zara, in terms of your experience in fashion. Um, Lola, as well as Kay, would be all of asking um, for more information on the kind of roles in the fashion industry. They mentioned a buyer and kind of what uh, that kind of day looks like in the world of a buyer and also how do you get uh, work experience in fashion. So I don't know if you have any quick gems you give to the two folks there sure sure um i think the, the the first thing that i always point to whenever um i would meet somebody and they would say well, what's a buyer i would always say um it's what rachel from friends would do um, and it always looks very glamorous on, like, um, on screen, um, but I promise you um, that there's a lot of hard graft involved. So what a buyer does essentially um, is um, uh, constantly foresee uh, what it is that we're all going to be wearing uh, before we know that we want to wear it. Um, and how they do that, um, and I guess what a typical day looks like, um, is um, constantly uh, making sure that you're on top of the latest trends um, uh, and seeing what's bubbling up, so micro trends, um, which is getting a lot harder now, I think now, where we are living in such a reactive 
um, climate and landscape. Um, it means that there are things that are able to bubble up um, a lot quicker. Trends are able to catch on a lot quicker um, and people are able to react a lot quicker. Um, and similarly, they, they can die down a lot quicker as well. So always making sure that you put your finger on the pulse, um, I think is really important. Um, a typical day would involve uh, me sitting down um, with uh, my designer. Um, and uh, what we would do um, is we would hash out whatever our vision is um, for the up and coming season. So that would mean creating a range um, of, uh, say, uh, dresses um, that we think um, everybody will want to wear um, in uh, four to six months time. Um, and um, really going down um, to the depths in terms of um, what do they look like? Um, how far do we think we want to take them? How successful do we think they'll be? What colors should they come in? Uh, what buttons should they have on them? Um, so basically planning everything that's going to be in store um, and online um, uh, in advance, but also, as I mentioned, being reactive to trends as well. So if there's something that you've bought into uh, six months ago that's um, still flying off the shelves, how quickly can I get back into that? Um, and uh, will it still be relevant by the time that I can? And just being mindful of um, what's going on all the time. Um, and I think that's, um, that works both ways. So if there's something that you really believed in, um, that actually maybe it's not translating as well. Maybe you thought, I don't know, uh, a checked green uh, boob tube was going to be uh, all the rage in summer, um, but everybody's stuck at home through lockdown and nobody wants to wear it. Okay, so how can we get out of that as quickly as possible as well? Um, and that's where you see things going into sale and markdown. Um, so I think um, from a personal um, standpoint as well, always be mindful that what you see in sale is in sale because it wasn't selling. Um, and um, I think I saw another question about how, um, how I got into that. Um, was that quite interesting actually um, uh, and I think that relates back to something that Kate mentioned about soft skills so um, I studied um, at the University of the Arts um, so London College of Fashion um, I knew that I wanted to work in buying um, and I studied that to a degree level and um, so I was fully qualified and um, history um, that I find it really difficult to actually get my foot through the door so I worked um, in retail at the same time while studying at university I worked in top shop um, on the shop floor and it was actually through building those connections on the shop floor um, when I would see um, uh, those visiting from head office for meetings um, that would walk around the store I made sure that I introduced myself I made sure that I was visible um, I made sure that I was um, building those connections so that when there was a vacancy that opened up um, I knew um, that uh, my name was already known um, and that I built that um, that report um, already um, so um, in terms of how to get experience I, I definitely say um, that uh, um, make yourself available, make yourself visible in all the ways that you can. Um, um, no job is too small. Um, don't be afraid to get your hands dirty um, and, and reach out. Absolutely. Um, uh, message people on Instagram, email them, um, go up to people when you see people in store. Um, I promise you um, uh, there is no one way to get into the fashion industry. It's, it's uh, kind of a, um, uh, a mix of everything and um, making sure that you're always presentable at all times. Sure. Yeah. Thank you, Zara. Yeah. I mean, uh, another question that uh, Reese Ward has just put in is there, uh, I guess it's for anybody as well. So is there anything that you wish you'd done whilst you were at school to help you get uh, where you are now? Um, I guess that's broad, but uh, any, any tips, you, any subjects, any areas, any experience you wish you'd got that you kind of had to catch up on? Is there anything that kind of comes to mind? Languages. <laughs> a good one. How many languages do you speak though? You speak... I two. speak fluently three, yeah. Three. But they they have opened many doors for me. When I left uh, my country, I was born in Panama, in Central America. When I came to Europe, being able to speak different languages opened many doors for me, in many different industries. So that's something that I always advise people to do. Yeah, like, and when you're younger, right, languages is just way easier. <laughs> I'm not. I'm struggling now. I'm trying. I'm going to be brutally honest. Kate, Zara, have you got any? things that you wish you'd done at school which could have helped you for your career? I would say um, going back to kind of um, digital skills again so um, I think it's a lot easier now because there's a lot more information available online but definitely really honing um, skills such as Photoshop, Illustra Illustrator, InDesign and things like that um, because whilst I didn't think that it'd be important um, that I would always have a designer by my side actually being able to communicate your ideas um, all on your own and um, kind of um, having full autonomy of your projects whether they're personal or professional I think um, will mean that you, you have a lot more agency in the work that you do so definitely um, being able to use those kind of programs. 
for sure. Okay. And for people wanting to go into creative businesses and being um, self-employed, you know, having a knowledge of business, how business operates, uh, finances, your taxes, because as a photographer, I can tell you that we spend shooting maybe 5% of our time. The other 95% is dealing with clients, uh, networking, um, doing our finances, all the administrative work that nobody talks about. That is the majority of time. <laughs> Boring stuff. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> that takes time. Yeah. I mean, Kate, you talked a little bit about the kind of personability and stuff in terms of when you went to interviews and how that got you through. And the question that Kate uh, Tinsley put in is, do you have any tips for building confidence for college interviews? And I guess that kind of somewhat connects. Um, mm. Do you have you could maybe share on that? I think, um, I think rehearsing, role play, finding someone to deliver the kind of questions that are going to be asked of you, um, but really it is again going back to that that personality aspect of it and you don't obviously your interest will come through by the subjects that you studied and your reasons for applying for the subjects you want to study but also there are many other people that will be wanting to do those subjects too so who are you as a person what what do you do outside of college what makes you tick where, where do you see yourself going you know what are your aspirations um and yeah don't don't be afraid to go into that sort of detail rather than just going through the the sort of the black and white details of your application or you know the sort of statistics of why you should be that that person to take that course what will you get from going to that college and really put yourself as a as an asset to that college as well you know they, they would be lucky to have you study here because you're really good at this this and this and you're going to go on and you're going to work in this industry and have that have that confidence you know i mean fun fun little gem is like i've i've been on the interview side with kate too because kate was uh, <laughs> for the champion of the gadget and she interviewed very well so whatever she said <laughs> make note it worked uh, yeah, and, and don't and don't make it robotic i think i think something that um, have some humor is, is what I'm saying, you know, have a conversation with that person. As Patrick said, he, you know, we're colleagues now, but there was a time when he was a scary man that was going to tell me I either got the job or didn't get the job. So, you know, just, just try and make a, a kind relationship with that person and, and don't think about it too seriously. That's a good point. Yeah, for sure. Um, I guess, again, to all of us, um, obviously the Trampery is a social enterprise and that's a, a, what slightly differentiates us from other uh, co-working providers or business support providers that uh, you know just kind of provide space and that's that's it um, and many of you I imagine will likely whether you work for a small company or a large company probably work in a co-working space or, or a shared facility it's very much kind of part of the norm now for companies across the scale um, but speaking on kind of social issues I guess we all again Zara talks politically uh, JC we talked about the kind of onus of your of your work and, and Kate about the, the wellness the focus how is that kind of looking outward side of your work um, how has that kind of helped your kind of personal sustainability as you've grown as a, as a professional how has that guiding light of, a, of something other than self helped you um, stay as ambitious and creative as you all are that's anybody if they want to go for it for me when when I arrived at that place where I realized that those two parts of my life were in, in fact just one and that one informed the other. Um, it changed my life forever. It changed completely the way that I look at my work and that I, um, and that I look at, uh, at life. Um, I have to say that I was working from home uh, when I started my business for many years until I met you guys at the Trampery and then I came here and started working from here and finding that supportive environment uh, those people that not only are your, act as your co-workers, because when you're a sole trader, you're a freelancer, you work on your own, so you, you spend a lot of time on your own. Coming to a place where you find other people around you that wish you good morning, that you can have a coffee with, but also that can inspire you, that you see the, the beautiful work that they're doing. And there are so many um, people doing really, really beautiful work here, uh, working with social issues, not only the Trump itself, but some of the other members. Um, that they helped me realize that that's something that I wanted to do, that I don't, didn't want to have those two parts of my life separate. Um, so in, in my case, uh, it, changed, it changed my life forever and it changed the way that I conduct my business and that I offer my services to my clients. And uh, my clients are now like-minded people. They, they come to me because they like 
the way that I that I present myself, and they like the the issues that I care for, and everything that I do um, to benefit um, the world. Absolutely, and I guess Zara, with with a sustainable fashion accelerator, obviously that's exactly what the whole onus of the the program is, right? How how important is it for you now to be knowing that you're working to support emerging labels to better their practice from, you know, holistically, I guess. How has that helped you now in terms of your career? Um, I think going back to um, something you mentioned, um, how has it been my guiding light? I think um, that has been my guiding light in terms of my politics um, and kind of my upbringing um, and actually what the tipping point was for me moving um, over the side in terms of um, um, coming from a buying perspective or fast fashion perspective to moving over to sustainability um, it was um, being able to see women that looked like uh, me or um, an older version of me um, on the front lines um, in, in those working conditions in factories um, so it was um, it was a trip to a factory um, that um, that really um, hammered home um, kind of my my place um, in the industry and actually I realized that um, and a quote that I turn to quite a lot, not just in um, kind of my professional life, but in my personal life as well, that really guides me is that no no woman is is free and, um, is uh, free um, until um, uh, we are all um, we are all free. So um, and how I take that to mean is that um, I, I see women um, that could very easily um, I had been in their position, and actually what my responsibility is um, uh, through my upbringing and um, through my now is to do whatever I can to be able to um, amplify their voices um, and really push for change um, in my position um, and how we do that through the Sustainable Fashion Accelerator and um, something that I mentioned at the start um, of our session was uh, the concept of social sustainability uh, so when we think about sustainability we think about um, kind of more the physical aspects of that so a recycled tag or, um, or landfill um, and whilst they're very very important um, notions because they're, they're ones that we can see um, something that we really try to focus on at the Trampery, um, and I think about sustainability. So, how are your workers treated? Uh, what do what do those trade routes look like? Uh, what are those uh, factories looking like? And um, what's the quality of life um, uh, for your workers? And not just the ones that you can see in your office every day, but perhaps the ones that are a bit more hidden. Um, that maybe don't feel as though they've got a voice and how can you be their voice and um, so that's something that we really focus on um, at the Trampery and I think um, uh, that's almost uh, where I've come full circle so something that JC said is realising that those two parts of your identity aren't actually separate that they are one um, and uh, doing everything that you can uh, to really um, use your experiences um, to push for change for others. Absolutely. Um, and a question that kind of came into the chat, which I guess kind of relates to this, and okay, I guess you can speak about some of the gang members, but um, a question from Gabriel Malik is, what type of social enterprises are there in the Trampery? Um, and obviously, like I say, we are, but we have uh, companies feed to Google, and I guess we can kind of send links, but Charity is a, a delicious beverage, which also has a, a you know, ethical uh, supply chain principle, which is about giving back to the people who create the product as well as and the delivery of it. Also people like in the fashion side, we have a company called Petit Pli, who uh, their garments are made out of recycled plastics and have a, a growth principle inside. So they literally grow from eight to 36 months as the child grows. So again, sustainability, longevity of garments, and then also change.org, which is again, a, a, a petition uh, website infrastructure, probably the biggest in the world, basically, in terms of raising kind of collective voice to be able to make kind of big global changes. So not every business inside the Trampery is a quote unquote social enterprise. And, and as JC mentioned, I don't know necessarily JC, if you would say I'm a social enterprise photographer, you know, but, but you have elements of your work which correlate to that. So I would say um, social enterprises, yeah, it's kind of a, it's, it's a bit like, I mean, Zara always joke about the term SME, which is just like small medium enterprise, which is basically like 99% of the UK business economy. So social enterprise, don't get too stuck up on that term. You can, you can have a social enterprise mission no matter what you're doing. Um, but yeah, I guess, I guess in terms of kind of looking at, someone actually also asked, I feel like I have the right to at least answer one question myself, uh, considering I'm just putting all the onus on you guys to give the gems. Um, but they kind of asked uh, Isla uh, Adams, I have said your name right, uh, asked what my kind of day to day looks like. And I guess it's pretty similar to, to Kate in terms of house management. Um, so it's really the, the Tramperies 
kind of core thing is that sort of central person who manages the overall vibe and energy of a location. So again, when we design spaces, we oftentimes never have a reception. We have the kitchen as the reception. And that's that idea that, you know, when have you had the most kind of engaging, thoughtful conversations is when, you know, when you're in the kitchen with your family, not when you're stood by a reception desk looking over at someone who's like staring at the screen, which you can't see what's on the screen. So they're probably like Googling while they talk to you. Um, so yeah, so that kind of for me is the, the, the day starts at work very much in that space. And it's about kind of managing your own personal ability to uplift everyone through the good work that they do. Because as we all know, sometimes we, we do amazing work and then, you know, we, we kind of move on to the next and the next and the next and we don't celebrate those little moments. So I would say our kind of role is always just to kind of preserve that energy. And also uh, I am a musician and have a record label and, and manage as well. So oftentimes evenings are either in studio or, or you know, shooting videos or writing songs. So I think having that kind of creative balance, um, I studied music tech, so now doing what I do now, um, I kind of can't not do it. So I'd say in terms of what does a day look like, probably similar to you guys, right? Like it's never the, the same really. And I guess if it was the same, I'd probably find a way to make it not the same. <laughs> um, but in terms of, so for you guys working from home now, how is, how's your day changed? Have you really stuck to a routine? Have you made sure you got up at a certain time? Made sure you, I mean, you all look amazing today. I assume that's like standard attire for a day. Um, but yeah, what are the kind of little things that you've done to make sure that you're staying productive while not going into work or offices? Well, I am someone who enjoys the routine. So as soon as we had to stay home forcibly, um, I had to like create a routine for myself. Um, I am someone who, when I see chaos, I want to tidy up, I want to fix it, and I want to add structure. So when I saw that we were going to have to stay at home, I couldn't shoot, um, I lost most of my projects, I um, decided to create this like eight to six routine for myself, in which I also included time to exercise at least three times a week, to go for a run, do some yoga. The other day I had a meeting at the trampery where Kate is and uh, was doing yoga in between the desks because that was my yoga time. You. And I think it's really important to take care of yourself as well. Uh, it's not all, it's not all about work. It's also about taking care of yourself. Um, so just having like that structure, seeking out um, people who can support you, whether they live with you or you get in touch with them via Zoom um, or via phone, just trying to um, sustain maintain connections with uh, relatives or with friends because it's also really important to feel supported especially in these times um, that we're living so that's how I've, how I've survived <laughs> Kate how is your kind of day to day you've just started now coming back to the champion again to have have you felt any changes is there anything you want to carry over that you maybe didn't do before uh, well yeah I was um, furloughed for three months and I still kind of kept in touch with the team because that is, that's what really sets the Trampery apart is that support network and just knowing that people were still there, we still felt connected to each other even through this really uncertain time for, for many of us. Um, and during that time, I'm lucky that I'm a person that I don't need to be productive all the time, but I do like to feel like I've achieved something with that, with my day. Um, but I don't make that very rigid. I make it sort of, okay, maybe today I'll do a walk and then I can do a little bit of online learning tomorrow. I don't sort of say, well, if I you know, haven't done all of this, if my day hasn't been completely filled with all this stuff, because you can still burn out when doing that. So you've just got to be so fluid with how your energy is and how you're feeling day to day. And I hope that I've, I've only just been back for less than a week. Tomorrow will be my full week. Well, I'm still part time, so I'm doing three days, but tomorrow will be the first week back. Um, and I hope that I've just learned to just take things a little bit slower. Not everything needs to be done straight away. It's important that you do respond to things in a timely fashion, but you know, you don't need to be so stressed about these things. You can just take a step back and think, okay, what's the best course of action? Whereas when it's really manic, it's very easy to fall into a, I need to do this now. I need to do this now. And that's not sustainable for your, for you as a, as a person, you need to kind of, acknowledge when things are getting a bit too much and, and always reach out. There's nothing that I can recommend more than, than knowing who your support is and reaching out to them, whether it's your line manager, whether it's a parent or just a friend, just say that you're struggling a little bit and, and 
have a conversation that takes your mind off of that, even if it's momentarily, because otherwise you can really, you know, fall into a trap of your mind going into chaos mode. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. I guess finally to use our, I mean, they might have actually, was it the Guardian or the Times? Your family life was in broadsheet newspapers. So maybe they've read about your family life. I don't know. But, uh, <laughs> yeah, Google yeah. me. Um, <laughs> no, I, yeah, no, everything that you guys have said um, definitely rings true. I think, um, Kate, what you mentioned about being productive. I think, I think it's really easy to um, compare yourself at the moment. Uh, well, uh, nowadays, but definitely right now, I feel like, uh, we're living in a very switched on culture and it can be very easy to uh, um, allow yourself to be distracted um, uh, for your day to day because everything is so easily accessible online. So um, that means that not really giving yourself the time to process how you're feeling and your thoughts and um, not only that, but um, having a constant feeling that you must be productive or you must be achieving things because that's what you're seeing online. Um, and I think being, being mindful that um, a lot of the time what you see online isn't necessarily um, the realistic day to day. Um, and we always post our wins, we don't post our failures. And I think um, being mindful of that um, and something that's really, really helped um, hammer that home for me is, um, uh, Patrick, as you mentioned, um, if you'd read about me in the paper, you would know that um, um, I live with my family, um, which is um, lovely at the best of times, but it also means that um, sometimes it can be quite difficult to to have that mental space and have that mind space um, that you would normally get perhaps on your on your commute on your way to work. So um, I've realised that, that that one hour that I spend commuting to work is actually really valuable because it means that it's an hour where I actually don't have to do anything. I can just think and. Um, I think in lockdown, um, still um, remembering to give myself those moments where I don't have to be productive and I can just um, collect my thoughts and, and do nothing has is, is been really important. Amazing. Um, yeah, I'm conscious a little bit of time, but we do have a couple of questions. I'll make sure everyone who has questions gets them uh, fielded. Because obviously, thank you so much for, for taking the time to be with us and for putting those to us. And Zara, while, uh, while we have you, in terms of the the fashion industry specifically, um, Gabriel uh, Malik, who mm -hmm. asked a question earlier, sorry, um, asked, is fashion a good industry to get into now when lots of fashion brands and shops seem to be going out of business? Um, obviously, it's quite a difficult question, but in terms of you thinking about someone pursuing a career in fashion, how do you feel like the climate is now for getting into that industry? Um, I think I think we have to be realistic in terms of um, when we think about the, the sustainability of um, of fashion. Um, there is no one brand that can be 100% sustainable. Um, that is the very um, uh, um, almost uh, raison if of the fashion industry. Um, so I think um, being important that it uh, that you remember that it is um, a market that's very competitive and uh, and really taking the time to carve out um, and think about what it is that you can add that will be unique. Um, so something that's really important um, uh, to being able to convey um, to consumers nowadays is being able to tell a story and being able to be uh, mission driven. So a lot of companies nowadays, not just in the fashion industry, um, uh, but um, across all different types of fields, um, is you'll find that a lot of products um, or a lot of brands have a purpose behind them. So um, really trying to convey um, what it is that you feel passionate about um, and perhaps um, having a bit of a story behind that um, but definitely um, it is it is a, um, a market that um, is very very competitive um, so making sure that you you know what it is that you that you can offer and it doesn't necessarily have to be a product I think there's a huge gap um, right now in terms of expertise um, around um, being able to uh, manage the social aspects of that and that's something that we've definitely touched on um, today um, but also um, what we're seeing um, around the world in terms of the movement of making sure uh, that your workforces are sustainable um, and that includes um, being able to be representative um, of um, who your customer is so um, I think there's loads of different things that you can go into um, that don't necessarily have to be um, centered around creating a product um, but if that is something that you feel passionate about making sure that you're really trying to offer something that's different and, and, and really plugging a need. Amazing and to, to kind of wrap this up it feels like this is a good segue so uh, I was asked if there's kind of podcasts or webinars uh, that we could have, uh, offer is learning about how to start your own social enterprise and I guess the ultimate shout out is if you do google um, Charles Armstrong who's the founder of the Trampery he does have many interviews on YouTube and podcasts that he's appeared on where he specifically talks about his uh, mission and how he kind of 
as an entrepreneur, became a kind of social entrepreneur. Uh, so yeah, so if you search Charles Armstrong and Champery, there'll be lots of different media things. But I don't know if you guys have, um, it does, I guess it doesn't necessarily have to be for social enterprise uh, creation, but what kind of podcasts uh, do you guys listen to in terms of helping you for your kind of professional life? Maybe the personal life too, I don't know. To be <laughs> the um, School of Social Enterprises, they have really good resources on their website. That's a good place to look for. Uh, inspiration. Also one of um, the Trumperist members, Sabina, she has a really interesting podcast, uh, which uh, the name escapes my mind right now. Connecting People. Yes, Connecting People, exactly, where she talks uh, to a lot of entrepreneurs as well about their path and how they got to where they are right now. So they, the, her podcast is really inspiring. Yeah, and there's a, I'm on an episode as well, so humble, humble shout Check that one out. <laughs> uh, Zara, Kate, do you have any kind of little things that you listen to often? Maybe not on the tube into work as much as you used to, but help you. Um, yeah, um, I think one of my all-time faves um, from when I'm feeling particularly inspired is um, a podcast by NPR. It's called How I Made This. Um, and basically it, it goes through um, different founders talking about um, kind of what, where they got started and um, a lot of the um, companies that they feature are mission driven and they have a story behind them so that really ties back into something that we were talking about earlier um, and they've got a really good um, episode if you're looking for a place to start that was um, with the founder of Patagonia and um, which is a clothing company that is um, especially sustainable so um, definitely give that a listen um, and then one that's a lot closer to home um, that perhaps isn't necessarily social enterprise but definitely um, uh, in the creative field. Um, it's a podcast called um, In Good Company. It's by NTS um, and it's hosted by um, a writer called Otega Awagba. Um, and what she does is um, she, um, every episode she interviews um, different women um, in her network and in her sphere. Um, so a lot of the time they tend to be London based um, um, and just talking about how they got started. So it can be anything from um, a writer or um, a chef. Um, and I think that's really, really um, interesting to not necessarily pigeon your whole pigeon um, hold yourself um, into only listening to things or taking in or consuming information to do with your one field because you might be able to pick up something that um, is really useful um, from a different, different different field that can help you as well. For sure. Kate, have you got anything you'd like to share? Um, in terms of resources, uh, as JC said, the School of Social Entrepreneurs, there is also Social Enterprise UK which itself I believe is a social enterprise and they've got tons of resources and a team that are able to help and support you. Um, Unlimited, which is spelled U-N-L-T-D. That's, um, that's a company that we have worked with previously that also supports budding social entrepreneurs. And I think I would recommend doing some research into the sustainable development goals if this is something that hasn't come up for you yet, because that's kind of the, the foundation for social or um, global change and it's a it's 17 goals that the united nations are working towards um to to 2030 and it covers things from um, gender equality to proper sanitation to health and well-being and once you open that door there is so much that you can you can learn about um, and that that might be the, the kickstart for an idea that you think hey in my local area this is an issue and it, it links in with this and that's a really good starting point um, and then the website future learn has a load of really good free courses i've done quite a few of them whilst i've been off on furlough and just yeah getting more information about the sustainable development goals which has been quite inspiring for okay well what can we do as a company to to help with that so i recommend all of those things sure amazing well i guess it leaves me to say thank you to, to our panelists for all taking the time and thank you all for for joining and giving your questions and uh, hopefully from from the kind of backgrounds that, they, that our panelists have expressed the kind of specific sectors skills and tips they've learned along the way resources hopefully this has all kind of painted a, a hopefully a, a quite a unique and broad picture which we definitely can paint for the trampery and um, i know this world of work week has, has had some lots of different kind of sector stuff so hopefully we've covered some sector stuff as well as um, some kind of broader learnings but yeah definitely uh, google the trampery trampery.com uh, you're all welcome to, to join us once we can kind of open our doors fully and we'll have lots of events which I'm sure will be very uh, worthwhile and engaging for you all and definitely jccandonado.com uh, is it .com? Is it .com. .com? It's .com. Uh, yeah, so check out his photography work, incredible, incredible inspiring stuff. 
Um, and yeah, th thank you all again just for taking the time and um, yeah, don't be a stranger. So I think this Zoom call is just going to end that nowhere. So <laughs> who knows how this ends, but it's been a pleasure speaking with you all and have a lovely day. Thank you for having us. Thank you so much. No See you thank later, you guys. guys. Bye.